let's start with a few definitions so that we know that we're all on the same page. The word excursion is used relative to tendon movement. It is a noun describing the movement of a movable bodily organ or part from its resting position. So the word excursion used in relationship to flexor tendons means the movement of the tendon relative to its surrounding bed of tissue. But the word glide can also be used in a similar manner. It becomes somewhat confusing because glide can be both a verb, meaning to glide or to move, and in this case it would be normally used to describe a smooth and effortless manner of movement. But the noun is the act of gliding or the act of moving. So in this presentation, the word glide and the word excursion will be used interchangeably to mean the movement of the tendon relative to the surrounding bed. Now we are often most interested in the amount of excursion or glide or movement of the tendon. Let's imagine that this is the location of an injury and a repair of this flexor tendon. We want that location of that repair to move proximally, which it must do during finger flexion. It must move from there to there in order to achieve the maximum glide. It's this distance that we are concerned with when we're talking about tendon glide, the amount of movement. This location becomes this location during flexion, but it has to do with which joints are moving in which direction as to which way the glide is occurring. Now the terms tension, pull, load, or you could use energy, all describe the force that it takes to pull through that tendon to flex the finger. And it is the force not just to flex the finger, but to flex it against any resistance that's present. And as we'll see, that can be either internal or external resistance. Pulling proximally on a flexor tendon flexes the distal joints. The resistance that's added can be highly variable, and as we will discuss in the beginning, we desire that there be no resistance. The finger provides enough resistance in the very early stages of rehabilitation. We're aware of the five zones of flexor tendons as originally described by Verdon. And our initial goal in working with a tendon patient is to create some glide of the tendon, but not enough glide or pull or force that we create gapping or rupture of the repaired tendon. So we're looking for a balance in the early stages between enough motion but not too much motion. Our final goal is full contraction of the muscle tendon unit with full proximal glide of that tendon and also full elongation of the muscle tendon unit when it is relaxed. A reference I would direct you to is the publication of Tendon Surgery of the Hand published in 2012. This text will provide you, in my opinion, with a compilation of the most up-to-date information currently available. There's been a lot of interest and a lot of research in flexor tendons over the past 10 years, and this book will bring you up to speed, and you will notice that I frequently reference it throughout this presentation. Now, most of us would begin a presentation on flexor tendons talking about protocols. But the purpose of this presentation is not to provide protocols. 
It is to look at the individual characteristics of each zone and how they could be modified within a current protocol. The Duran protocol, which consisted only of passive range of motion of the digit into flexion and very limited extension, was one of the earliest protocols attempting to mobilize flexor tendons earlier than what had previously been a period of six weeks. Following the Duran protocol, Kleinert and Associates developed the concept of applying elastic tension to keep the finger flexed, but to allow extension against the resistive band. So this was active extension, but passive flexion. In 1987, Chow and Associates published a recommendation of adding a pulley in the palm, which provided better excursion of the flexor tendon. This came out of the Brook Army Medical Center and therefore is often referred to as the Brook Army Protocol. Sometime later in the early 90s, the tenodesis protocol was introduced by the Indiana Hand Center. This consisted not only of finger flexion and extension, but also incorporated motion of the wrist so that there was a tenodesis meaning that when there was wrist extension, there was finger flexion, and when the wrist flexed, there was finger extension. This allowed excursion of the tendon at multiple levels, but prevented the maximum excursion into full concurrent extension at all joints, which would provide tension to the flexor tendon. A bit prior to the tenodesis protocol from Indiana, Early active motion was begun as a protocol in Belfast. This and other centers throughout the world began using early active motion with a view toward decreasing the adherence and improving the results that were seen with particularly the protocol using a rubber band or the Duran protocol. Amadio suggests that active motion protocols provide no better results than passive because loading in the animal model gives no positive effects to healing. Loading is necessary to create movement of the tendon, but the loading itself does not enhance healing. In a more recent review by Starr and Associates on uh, flexor tendon rehabilitation protocols, the review concluded that passive motion protocols provide a higher risk of loss of motion, or in other words, active motion protocols do improve the result in terms of motion gained. But at the same time, the active motion protocols risk a, a greater possibility of rupture, although Historically, the rates of rupture are declining as we become more familiar with the parameters of active motion protocols. And looking at a specific protocol from Bern in Switzerland, it was interesting to note that they began by asking the question, is the flexor tendon repair reliable and free of tension? If the answer is no, they then choose a protocol for passive flexion and active extension. In other words, if there is a questionable quality repair, they choose the safest protocol. If, however, the repair is known to be reliable and it's free of undue tension, they then choose an early active flexion protocol. In other words, their choice of protocol is dependent upon the quality of the repair. If, however, it's unclear as to whether or not the repair is reliable and free of tension, they would begin place and hold, as well as use passive tenodesis in order to regain glide. There are many variables one must consider before deciding whether or not an active motion protocol is appropriate. The strength of the repair must be sufficient. When motion is started, 
determines the risk, the extent and type of injury and the status of the wound play an important role. Both the motivation and intelligence of the patient determine whether or not they can follow precise instructions. And your experience as a therapist with this protocol and the parameters of frequency and duration all play a role in determining whether or not active motion is going to be successful for a patient. Two of the most important factors, in my opinion, are the strength of the repair and when you start motion. We will discuss these in much greater detail as we move through this presentation. 